our next speaker is William Seeley, and I think he's going to take up some of these issues of proprioception and uh, cognition and processing, but we'll see. Um, and uh, <laughs> if not, we'll pose the, these questions in the question period. Anyway, he is a visiting assistant professor of philosophy at Bates College, and he's going to speak about Seeking Salience, a short story about engaging art. Bill. <laughs> All right. Um, I wanted to actually, again, thank everyone for this great uh, collection of, of people talking about art from so many different angles in so many different ways. And I want to thank Marcos particularly for putting some things up about the brain so it'll be harder for me to follow in that footstep as a simple philosopher. So I wanted to talk about um, salience actually today. So um, there's this model, I think, <clears throat> that uh, is tacitly underlying a lot of current research in neuroscience of art. Uh, I think it's actually probably better termed cognitive science of art, but maybe, maybe there's a, we're just trying not to differentiate between neurophysiology, particularly in cognitive neuroscience more broadly. So uh, actually, there's this nice thing, and Baumgarten certainly uh, saw it, and then Kant ruined everything by excluding it. Uh, it's true. Um, uh, so art and cognitive science are actually natural bedfellows, I think, quite natural bedfellows, right? So cognitive science, in its most broad definition, is an interdisciplinary study of how organisms, um, if I can remember what I've written, acquire, represent, manipulate, and use information in the production of behavior, which I once used to coin the very worst acronym ever, the ARMUI model <laughs> of thinking about, about art. <clears throat> so look, artworks are communicative devices. They're these unique and fun and abstract communicative uh, Devices, they're stimuli that are designed to trigger uh, perceptual, affective, and cognitive responses that enable consumers to recover their content. And you don't really, the content isn't on the work, so to speak, and the content isn't even in these features or in these responses. It takes a lot of work to get the information out of an artwork, right? So how do artists develop the vocabularies that they use to do this? Well, they develop them through systematic explorations of the behavioral effects of these stimuli, often on themselves, on their assistants, on other folks, right? And so the model that's come to be developed for thinking about the science of art suggests that these facts naturally make artworks fine-tuned to uh, a set of basic psychological processes to the operations of cognitive systems. So that suggests that we can study art by studying the way consumers acquire, represent, and manipulate, and use information embedded in the surface of an artwork in order to recognize and evaluate their content. And there's actually been an explosion of work in the last 10 years. I think when I first taught a seminar on this material 15 years ago, I, I couldn't say it was a field. But I think it's actually become quite a field in the last 15 or 20 years. Marcos will actually probably attest to this in greater detail. But <clears throat> as this field grows, uh, philosophers, as we do, because what else would we do if we couldn't, have a worry or two. <laughs> and the worry that philosophers have about this kind of field, one that I don't actually share particularly, goes back to Wittgenstein, to some comments that he made in his conversations and lectures um, on aesthetics. And the worry goes something like this. The kinds of causal psychological explanations that we get about our engagement with artistic stimuli are precisely the same ones that we use for non-art stimuli. They're precisely the same ones that we use for judgments about art that are good and are bad, ones that are correct and incorrect, and precisely the same ones we give for people's interactions with artworks that are particularly bad and are particularly good. So there's some question whether the kinds of processes that we use to explain artworks in this context are tracking the artistically salient properties, are tracking the artistically relevant processes, or whether something else is going on. So in uh, Wittgenstein's writing, the story went something like this. I think he actually said it would be funny if you look to the brain to study art. I mean, literally, he said, that would be very funny indeed in the text, um, literally. Uh, <coughs> But it's because what he thought was happening when we appreciated artwork, which is what he thought mattered, I don't know if he's correct about that or not, was that we were comparing something we had already perceived to a set of conventions for evaluating whether it was good or bad. So that your evaluative, your aesthetic, your artistically salient judgments were post 
perceptual comparisons between what you perceived and a category of art. All right? And so this is the story. I think Marcos has heard me say this before twice, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the story. And so uh, really what the challenge philosophers might think is, how do we explain why artworks are engaging in a way that's unique? How do we explain why we find these engaging uh, in a way that maybe we wouldn't a Polaroid snapshot looking out from the past beyond Tucson into the desert, for instance? Right, so why, how do we find them engaging? So uh, my thought I, is, is that uh, we need only look at the structure of perception. That we could generate a model for why we find them engaging by looking at the structure of perception so that it'll emerge actually uh, in a way, well, that shows Wittgenstein was wrong. So uh, I'm sorry that the Rousseau is so dark so that you can't quite see it. So perception. Uh, I mean, we have many ways of thinking of perception, but one thing to notice when you think about perception is that there's a problem of selectivity, right? There's a problem of selectivity right from the beginning when we think about perception, right? So we live in an environment that is dynamic and replete with sensory cues, right? We live in a, an environment that's dynamic, replete with sensory cues. The sensory cues that bombard us all the time, there are just so many of them. But our perceptual systems are limited processing capacity systems, right? We, we, we can't process everything. We have to prioritize information right, right from the start, right? And so, right, perception needs a, a strategy for efficiently allocating these limited perceptual resources. Uh, I don't know, it probably says this on the next slide, but for instance, if I'm reaching out to shake someone's hand, I don't want to become distracted by what it says on their t-shirt. Right? I mean, there's, there, there's just some pretty simple, sort of straightforward stories. So right, there's a suggestion for how we solve this problem. I'm going to build a schematic model from uh, some work that Philippe Shins has done on a concept of diagnosticity, a diagnostic recognition framework, and a biased competition model for selective attention for how to solve this problem. Right? So <clears throat> one suggestion for how we solve this problem is that we might, rather than modeling the whole environment and then recognizing what we've seen, rather than building a perceptual model of the whole environment and then matching it to what we know, we might instead use minimal sets of perceptual cues uh, that are sufficient for us to categorize what we're looking at in a very quick and dirty process. And we might use those cues to then drive further visual search, further perceptual search. And uh, I think uh, yesterday, a couple of people talked about a hypothesis testing model for object recognition and visual search, right? So the story uh, might go something uh, like this, right? A very quick glance at the environment is sufficient to give us a quick categorization judgment, which sets a set of sort of constraints on what to look for. It might direct our attention in some way, right? So. <clears throat> Uh, Philippe Shins has suggested that in different uh, contexts, right, different tasks set different sorts of information processing constraints, set different sorts of ways for us to look at the environment. But more importantly, what he thinks is that different categorizations of the environment can change the diagnosticity of different cues, can change what they show us, what they suggest to us about the environment. And also, uh, they can alter the analysis of a stimulus into discrete cues, and they can uh, alter the appearance of a stimulus. So how you categorize the environment changes the way you perceive it. I think we're probably all familiar with this. I think every artist in the room does this all day long as they walk through the environment. So right, we have this story about diagnosticity and about diagnostic cues. So I always like, like to do this. So who can tell me what's wrong with Picasso's chimpanzee, other than that he doesn't really know what a chimpanzee looks like. <laughs> Who can tell me what's wonky about Picasso's chimpanzee? Anybody? The tail is weird looking. No. Uh, what's wrong about it is that its head is a citroen. <laughs> what's wrong about it is that his head is a cast toy model car. <laughs> Well, it's not really wrong about it. It's probably what's right about it, because that's what this kind of artwork was supposed to be about. There's actually a very funny text that makes it very cute, like he picked up his son's car, and it was really nice, which is kind of funny in the long run. OK, you don't think it's funny. <laughs> I think it's ridiculous. So actually, the head is a, cast, two, is a casting of a car set on top of each other. And so the suggestion here is that the shape of the car carries these diagnostic cues right 
for you to recognize a chimpanzee's head, and people will miss it. Now, I've purposely chosen this blurry picture that Gombrich put in his book rather than the actual photograph. It's much easier to see when you're in person, but that one works pretty well. Uh, this one I like. This is a, an example uh, by St. Kavanaugh, Peter Kuzay, I think. Uh, uh, and it's a story about, uh, this is the only proprioceptive-ish example I have from this talk. It's a story about drawing this kanji. So uh, I don't have a, an anima animation of it, I'm sorry, but the story is that what they do is they show people this kanji and then the screen goes blank and then the strokes come in in order as they would be drawn, but they aren't drawn in, they just appear, all right? So they come in one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's this neat kind of uh, apparent motion illusion called a transformational apparent motion illusion, where instead of something looking like it's moving, something will look like it grows out of something. All right? Uh, and this cool thing happens. If you know how to draw the kanji and you're a Chinese speaker, you see the sixth stroke drawn in towards the fourth stroke. But if you don't, you see it go in the other direction. So having the motor skill for, draw, right, for being able to make the kanji changes the diagnosticity. This is kind of cool, right? <clears throat> uh, I don't know, we could just run through uh, John Hyman's example. When I teach this, uh, I tell the students, I prime them by telling them we're talking about abstract expressionism, I talk about the flatness of the canvas, I talk about right, the love of brush stroke, and most of the students in the room then see the image up here as, a, uh, as two marks on an indeterminate flat ground. And that works pretty well. Uh, then I tell them I was lying, and I tell them it's actually a Sumi-e landscape painting, and that Sumi is an ink drawing style. And um, what you're supposed to do is draw landscapes with a stillness of your brushstroke, an efficiency and stillness. And if it works well, and it usually works for about 70% of the people in the room, they see a cabin at the base of a mountain with another mountain in the shadow. And so I've taken them by altering the diagnosticity of the cues by changing the categorization from this flat surface, this very flat thing, to something in long perspective. I'm gonna have to start moving very fast in a second, but these are more fun than pictures of brains, for God's sakes, come on. Uh, so what is it really? Adolf right, it's a caricature of Adolf Hitler, actually. Right, and so if you see that, it suddenly becomes this object defined by a configural cue, and I've changed the categorization, right, simply by changing the categorization. Uh, there's actually a, a very nice study by, um, by uh, Lizanne Bonar, Frederick Gosselin, and Philip Shins, uh, looking at Dolly's uh, slave market with disappearing bust of Voltaire, which shows that the diagnostic cues in the painting <clears throat> that enable people to see either the bust of Voltaire or the two nuns going to buy a slave uh, is carried in the difference between uh, spatial frequency information is used in the painting. So they filtered the, the center part of the painting into these five spatial scales from fine spatial frequency to coarse spatial frequency and were able to show that Voltaire is in the coarse information and that the nuns are in the fine information. There's a little overlap in the middle. And then they did a spatial frequency adaptation task where they asked participants to just look at the static. They would either knock out a fine spatial frequency or a coarse spatial frequency channel. And the people who had their fine spatial frequency uh, perception knocked out saw Voltaire and vice versa. So this is actually kind of a nice story because it shows that the diagnostic cues aren't, they're not even at a semantic level, right? They're being carried at a very base perceptual level to help you make these categorizations. So anyway, uh, the theory here uh, that I have thought is that what artists learn when they engage in this sort of cooperative story where they're interacting with artists and they're interacting with themselves and they're interacting with perception is that they actually learn how to call diagnostic cues from the environment that'll be sufficient for them, right? to generate, well, the depictive content of their artwork, but actually it's not, that's not quite the content they're worried about, but let's talk quickly about attention, then we'll talk about the content they're worried about. So there's some, uh, the next question is, what, what kind of mechanism do we have for implementing this kind of a diagnostic recognition framework? How is it that we go about getting this information as we get it so quickly? And so the, the, the quick story, the philosopher's neuroscience story, goes something like this. There's a biased competition uh, theory of selective attention that says something like this. Uh, in perception, we have these corticothalamic networks 
that generate these feedback loops. And what the feedback loops do is, right, after a very quick categorization judgment, you have information traveling from prefrontal cortex back to sensory cortex, and that enhances the populations of neurons that the firing rates of the populations of neurons that would fire where you're looking at the thing you expect or the feature that you're looking for, and that enables that information to sort of come to threshold more quickly when you see it in the environment, and that that in turn inhibits the perception of distractors in the local environment, maybe helping explain something of Marcos's report of Crangiola's study, right? And so you kind of get this nice story that quick and dirty categorizations that you might get from looking at these diagnostic cues are then used to bias perception to the kind of information that would be salient to the correct perception or the, I don't know, the communicative interpretation of, of the artwork, right? And this is kind of a nice story. Uh, the thing that I like a lot about this tale is that uh, there are a number of different kinds of networks that are acting together to do this. You have unimodal uh, networks doing this. You have sensor motor right, networks doing this. And you even have affective networks doing this. So very quickly, right, the idea is, remember we talked yesterday a little bit about a dorsal and a ventral processing stream. The idea is that there's a little bit <coughs> of a sort of a little bit of an advantage to dorsal processing. So the idea is that the information comes up through the dorsal processing stream into uh, the medial orbifrontal cortex, which is the blue kind here, and that that interacts with the autonomic nervous system, with the visceral motor system, and actually reenacts the affective context of having perceived this stimulus in the past. Right? So here's a funny thing to think of. We talk about cognition uh, rather coldly. We talk about categorization and perception rather coldly as if they're these things that happen in a computer, maybe, and maybe they could happen in a computer. But in point of fact, there's probably never been an experience you had that didn't come paired with your body. If you're like me, you wear your body every day, everywhere you go, and your body has a feeling to it, right? And so there's probably never been a perceptual experience you had that wasn't affectively inflected in some way. Right? And so there's probably going to be some story, so I can obviate about 10 slides, some story to tell about how all of your basic level perceptual categories, or probably all of your perceptual categories, carry some affective content with them. So that in perceiving this thing, you're going to send this information into your body, you're going to get this reenactment of the affective context of having perceived it. And that information then, if I understand uh, Lisa Barry and Moshe Barr's model, correctly gets fed into the lateral over the frontal cortex where it's used for multisensory integration and the same kind of attentional biasing that might happen otherwise. So the story about these biased competition networks is that they give us a tale about how we might use this category knowledge to bias perception in an ordinary context where it's really important to do it quickly, I suppose, right? So uh, here's the thing I like. This is probably more important for a philosophical crowd than uh, for the choir that we might be preaching to today. One really uh, neat and cool thing that Odd talked about yesterday as well is that the response latencies, right, when we measure the activation of these processes, is really fast, right? So you're getting activation in the parts of the prefrontal cortex that are driving this feedback in, you know, 100 to 200 milliseconds. So it's an open empirical question how far you can push this towards your conscious experience of an artwork. But certainly when we think of artworks as an information processing story about how we collect information from the artworks in order to understand how to experience and how to perceive them, this is happening really fast and it's driving our perception quicker than we could be conscious of, right? So the philosopher's view that category knowledge needs to be this post-perceptual conscious comparison looks to be, it looks to be up on the chopping block of philosophical ideas which is big, because it needs a lot of room, right? There's a philosopher named Dan Dennett who uh, once gave a nice talk at the APA about how anytime said ne somebody said never, you should wait 10 years <laughs> and see what they said never about next time. Anyway, I, I guess maybe I'm going to skip over the anatomical part, because I think we should talk a little bit about artworks, right? So how do we match this into a story about engaging with artworks? How do we match this into a story of engaging with artworks? Well, uh, <clears throat> there's a philosopher named Noel Carroll, 
who um, sometimes writes about uh, a question about artistic form. So what's the form of an artwork? We talk about the formal composition of an artwork. We talk about the composition of an artwork. But sometimes we don't actually bother to think that this is a complicated question. Because an artwork has lots of parts. Right? An artwork is replete with information. It has lots of parts. What is the artistic form of a work? Well, the artistic form of a work, I think, isn't just the sensory, just the formal compositional uh, bit of it. The artistic form of the work is that bit of the work that defines its salience. Right? The artistic form of the work is the formal compositional part of the work that the artist sort of really manipulated to get you to work. So what Noel says, if we want to know how to recover the artistic form, right, and we want to do it quickly and on the fly, what we do is we ask, why did the artist build it that way? And that's going to help us, when we look at Winslow Homer, worry less about the awesomely dynamic waves, although they're going to play some role, and more about what's going on over here. This painting is called The Fog Warning. Right? And if we know a little bit of the painting, and we know a little bit that it's a fog warning, we can sort of tell a story about its formal composition that gets us the capacity to recognize the look on the character's face and, and what he's up to. Right? Uh, I don't know. This one is kind of fun. This is an Arthur Danto example. Uh, this one could either be called the Newton's first law of motion, or it could be called Newton's third law of motion. Right? And if it's Newton's first law of motion, it's a block pushing up on a block, and it's just two objects, right? But if it's the third law of motion, it's the path of a particle moving through space. Right? That's radically different formal compositions depending upon what you think the artist was doing with this, right? And notice, if we've played this right, this fits nicely into our story about categorization diagnosticity. And I don't know if it plays into our story about biased competition. My assessment is that the biased competition story gives us a tale about how we get the differing spatial perceptions out of these two bits and pieces, right? I don't know, do you know what this artwork is called? Does anybody know? It's actually not called Red Square, although we call it Red Square because we want Malevich to have no representational, um, no representational residue because of the things he wrote. It's actually called Painterly Realism of a Peasant Woman in Two Dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I was going to swear a little bit, but I remembered I wasn't in class, so I've got to behave myself. It's wicked weird, as we say where I'm from. So, but if you know he's a Bolshevik, right? If you know he's a Bolshevik, and you know that Red Square was a symbol for sort of national pride, and that the Tsar had moved the government to St. Petersburg, then it's not really surprising that he painted a Red Square. Why he painted it skew, you have to work a little harder. Of course, he would have wanted to industrialize the country, and it was hard to industrialize in a grand country. Now, I'm interpreting on the fly. I'm pretty sure this is not the right interpretation of the work, right? But I've given the skew shape of the square some salience, and that ought to sort of drive our attention to it. So I have sort of seven minutes to get through the hard work, right? But this is really the hard work, right? Because here we have a story about how categorization changes the way we perceive the work, changes the way we attend to its features, and we have maybe a model uh, for how that might start. So the tale here is we want to know now what a category of art is like. We can understand how categorization might drive things this way in perception, because our basic perceptual categories are statistically learned categories of right? spatial regularities, future regularities. It's pretty obvious. right? Categories of art are a little more complicated than that. We might actually wonder whether categories of art can do this kind of work. So we want to tell a story, a quick story. It's kind of like Ernest Gombrich's story. And it goes something like this. Even in landscape painting, which we take to be a realistic depiction of the things we see, although probably people in this room don't think that, right? We recognize that there are an infinite number of ways that you could produce a realistic looking painting. There isn't a single solution to painting realistically, right? And what that means is that artists have to make choices when they produce their formal productive strategies, even in the case of realistic painting. And when they make those choices, one of the sets of constraints on those choices are the evaluative conventions, the evaluative responses of the people they're talking to, the aesthetic conventions, their theory of art. There are all these cognitive semantic conventions on how this works. They want people to respond correctly, and they're going to respond correctly if it matches something that they're categorically familiar with. And so we get Ben Roysdale, we get Constable, 
uh, Thomas Cole, Robert Bechtel, and Rackstraw Downs. Uh, I don't know, there isn't really 100 years between each of them, but that was, kind of the, that was kind of the hope, right? And we get a very different look for each of these categories of art, and knowing how to look at them actually requires knowing something about the history of landscape painting. I don't know if Rackstraw Downs really intended it, but the Constable and the Rackstraw Downs are both painted with a fisheye perspective. Right. This is actually kind of a nice connection, right? So what do we get? Categories of art turn out to be these cool things, right? They're developed of these productive and evaluative conventions that are born of the way artists engage in this systematically cooperative process of building cultural categories of art in this kind of distributed way, right? And these things shape then the way we look at the artwork, because once we know how to categorize it, we know how to look for the diagnostic cues. So for instance, the surface articulation of these works, right, is a cue to look for the way the bodies move as opposed to whether they're well depicted or poorly depicted or something like that, right? You know it's an impressionist painting, impressionist sculpture, then you know what matters is the biological motion cues and not, I don't know, the sort of interactive cues. So I wanted to finish in three minutes. I actually almost never get to this example, so this is pretty good, I'm doing okay. So there's a thought study, a thought experiment, written by a philosopher named Kendall Walton in 1974. And it was a thought experiment designed to challenge a view and aesthetic theories of art that history doesn't matter. That history and context don't matter because aesthetics is this universal language, universal perceptual language, right? And so Kendall Walton asked us to imagine, and I'm sorry, I don't have an example. I've been trying to get our imaging center to use the CAD printer to build me a bas relief of this painting, and they keep saying that maybe that's not the most important thing. Maybe they should map watersheds for uh, beforehand, but <clears throat> we'll get one. So he asks us to imagine that there's this culture that, like us, has uh, a category of art called Guernicas. Our category of Guernicas is very small. It involves one cubist painting depicting the horrors of the fog of war, right? <clears throat> the Guernica uh, is this painting that's two-dimensional, it's not monochromatic, it's bichromatic, right? It's black, black and white, right? That's the way we might want to think about it here, right? And it gets its power by virtue of the foreshortening of the forms which cause this chaos, this dynamic chaos, because it's in, right? It just sort of flattens everything out and everything's in a jumble, right? Well, the idea is that the culture of Guernica's does this in bas relief, so they do it by cutting into the surface in a very low way. So the dynamics of the bas relief Guernica comes from the way the same formal structure is articulated using this method of cutting into the surface, right? So the dynamic cues for the Guernicas are carried in depth. So if somebody who liked Guernicas came to see Guernica, they would be confused by it. That's a thought experiment. We have to play a little bit, right? But the idea is that the culture of Guernicas would come upon Picasso's Guernica and wonder why he painted such a calm and serene painting about war. And they might find it aesthetically distressing or just aesthetically boring. Why? Because it lacks those depth cues that they're using to get the dynamics out. Now, I don't know about you. When I think about uh, the Guernica that's a bas relief, I think that that would be really boring. It would be brown, flat gray. And I wouldn't be able to see the dynamics in it. Because when I think about it, it's hard for me to imagine getting the dynamics cut into a surface in the same way, even if it had precisely the same formal structure. Right? And so the thought here is that not only do these categories of art change the depictive content they get, but they, they, don't even, they, don't, don't they, they don't just do the semantic content, they also affect the aesthetic content. Depending upon the different categorizations, we might see this as violent and disturbing, or we might see it as calm and serene. Right? And so, I don't know, the story that I kind of like to finish with this is that, of course, if this seems like a bit of a confusing example to you, it might not be because bas reliefs are confusing to you. It might be because living in an avant-garde time, stretching categories is a practice that we're familiar with. Right? So it might be that when you looked at the bas relief, or when the people who liked the bas relief looked at the Picasso, they might say, well, maybe this categorical mismatch that caused them to have some confusion, it might cause some aesthetic, 
affective distress that might make them feel like this was a bad painting, but what they would recognize in the low spatial frequency information that it was precisely the same formal structure as this category of art that they were familiar with. And they might, right, see category violations. They might see category violations as a standard artistic practice, in which case they might not give up on the work, but they might start looking through their right through their repertoire of categories for one that would make sense of using these kinds of diagnostic cues as a communicative practice, and that might enable them to snap it back into focus. Now, uh, you, you know, I think that there's a lot of work to do to stretch between the cognitive neuroscience, the cognitive psychology, and the story about conceptual artworks that we might be telling here. Because we, you know, they're kind of apples and oranges in thinking about these different categories. But I think we have a schematic model, right, for how it's not actually true that thinking of these things as an information processor doesn't get us artistic value, doesn't get us artistic salience, doesn't explain why they're engaging. And so to summarize quickly, right, we have this tail. It says that I'm it's flashing crazy like I've, like, like a, it's like a James Bond movie or something. Uh, right, that we might think of artworks as attentional engines. We might think of artworks as attentional engines intentionally designed to drive our perceptual capacities towards these features that carry diagnostic information, right? Uh, and if that's the case, then we get that our categorical and evaluative judgments are built into the architecture of perception and our productive constraints that partially determine what we perceive and shape how we perceive it, which I think is the right place to stop for seeing and knowing. Thank you. Okay. A couple, I think the microphone, we have two down here, too. Should I talk? Um, I just had a question about how um, strongly the tendency to move towards salience or um, something to, to um, is in a person because sometimes like with I guess perception or art sometimes people try to teach people to like look at things openly and like to hold back that judgment right. and just see it at the level of perception and I was also thinking about the flexibility in some people like who get really decisive and go I know this and it's not just about expertise but it can be sort of an openness to experience and I wondered if you thought that was sort of a um, how that came about, mm. or not how that came well, about. I thought it's, so I thought you were going to say, I wondered if you thought this was a challenge to this idea of attentional interest. Okay, but, you but can I think phrase that, it that way. <laughs> I, I think that's a great observation. And so um, I guess I started my life as a sculptor. And uh, I guess I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to look at any artwork. Right, and I don't, you know, I used to sometimes go work for artists because I wasn't a great fan. Not a, I didn't, well, I didn't like the work. I didn't want to get involved with the art of an artist who I really was engaged with because I wanted to keep my work life and my life separate. But I found that once you became perceptually habituated to the work, it became fascinating. Right, that you learned the category of art that would help drive you to the salience of that work, even if at first you didn't really quite understand why it was salient at all, and you, you'd come to be quite good at it, right? So, so I think that the story about how we get to the salience is a story about what we know, right? I think uh, that Marcos could probably speak to this because he probably has a better recollection of the studies than I do. Uh, my recollection is that naive viewers go to the depictive content of a representational painting, whereas educated viewers have a more regimented way of attending to its surface and in the long run, make perceptual judgments that are more categorically, more art historically driven. But in particular, what we've learned as experts is to fight the perceptual salience of the features on the, right, fight the, the way the features stand out ordinarily, and look for the semantic contributions of art history, right? And so, right, what's salient in this image is gonna be different depending on which categories you, you, you bring to play. But understanding the work. So here's the tricky part. What I think is that artists really do mean to communicate something when they make artworks. That may not be what we, I mean, as a practice, we may not, that might not be the thing we favor the most, right? But that understanding the work as it was intended to be, to be perceived 
involves these kinds of processes. Is that okay? Let me take this question. So um, I love the phrase attentional engine. Um, I, I think it's a really useful one. And, um, and then also what's useful is that it connects us back to another aspect of aesthetics, which is modern aesthetics and the work of Adorno, and the kind of analysis of the kinds of works that sustain attention, okay. and, and why those are privileged works in his particular um, set of analyses, critiques, and, and categories. So I think it's useful for us to pull that sense of aesthetics as, a, as, a, you know, as having another set of concerns um, into this conversation. Um, and, uh, but, but my observation, that, first of all, terrific talk, um, is I wonder if we end up in a slightly different place from where we start um, in your talk, in the sense that the, the concept of an attentional engine to me um, uh, uh, suggests that the, uh, what is produced in the relationship between um, you know, a, a, a generative work and a um, sort of active participant experience um, is experience, not content. That in other words, um, you know, we're, that, that works of art are not about communicating content, but about provoking and sustaining experience. And so I, I frankly don't think artworks are communicative vehicles. I think they are um, experiential uh, provocateurs. So, um, and, and your notion of the attentional engine actually takes us to that place. Yeah. Right, so um, the, I, I suppose that the very first thing to say uh, is that Adorno and Noel Carroll are at opposite poles of thinking of the philosophical world, right? Uh, so I can't speak to the Adorno m material. I, I, uh, I will say that I, I always find the Frankfurt School to be fun to read. And I don't, I mean, really. But, but that the analytic philosophers are after something slightly different. Um, so I actually think that they don't have to be different. Uh, the story that uh, an analytic philosopher in this kind of a context is trying to tell is the story of conceptual art, the story of what we do with artworks that, I don't know, are supposed to start with Warhol's Brillo box and move up to now. I don't know if we need to think of conceptual art as non-experiential. I think it's silly to think of it as non-experiential. I think that it, it's a little bit off kilter, but it's to worry about them as contentful vehicles, vehicles for the expression of ideas. So here's the way I want to come back to it, though. Although the response latencies in these processes are very quick, they go on over time, right? And the thought is that um, getting that content is going to alter your experiential engagement with the artwork, right? You categorize the work, that changes your experiential engagement, that causes you to categorize the work, change your, right? So that there isn't going to be this distinction between understanding the content of the work and this experiential engagement with the work over the time. They're going to come hand in hand. And I don't want to spend too much time on the point because I want to get to some other questions. But if you think of early conceptual or early minimalism, early conceptual or early minimalism I, th I think are good examples. Uh, although they, the artists talk about these as just about ideas. Your engagement with the idea is about visually engaging with the piece, right? I'm actually thinking of the Robert Morris dance site that I had on the first slide, right? And so although it's supposed to get you to think of art in this special way, this content that Arthur Danta is interested in, you can only get it by running through the experiential, right? And so I think that maybe another, the way I would phrase what you said is it's a way of bringing these poles of philosophy back together to think of them as thinking together. But maybe I didn't get to the right answer for your question. OK, there was more. Thank you for um, some provocative um, considerations. I, I'm just wondering if I got correctly this bow relief this other oh, right. culture looking at Guernica and, and whether it would be like us looking at black and white movies. I know they're so much better. <laughs> There's so much less information in them, they're awesome. <laughs> All your imagination stretches. Yeah. So am I? Yeah, that's kind of the idea. Getting that right? Or my, you know, so 
Yeah, that's a good one. My children can't stand the movies I loved from the late 1970s and the early 80s because they're plot driven. <laughs> they want to know where the CGI battle scene is at the end, right? And, and, the, and the cuts, actually, the real reason I think is that the cuts are longer. I think the average length of a cut in a movie has come down to about eight, six to eight seconds. Right? And so there are these long conversations, and they're like, what on earth? <laughs> Superman is the most boring guy ever. He just sits there and blathers on. Uh, yeah, no, no, I think that is. So I, is there another question? I think the experiential question is actually really, I mean, I think that's the, so aesthetics is a long, reflective process, right? And thinking of these things as quick, contentful processes, it leaves that part out, and I don't mean to. That's really the point. One quick question. Do you differentiate between evaluating artworks in terms of creativity versus aesthetics? Uh, so I have to say that I wrote my dissertation on the neurophysiology of aesthetic experience, but I'm not really sure aesthetics play the kind of role that we think aesthetics play in art, which is not to say it doesn't play any role at all. It's not to say that art is anti-aesthetic. Uh, it's to say that I think that aesthetic features, aesthetic properties, and the experiences that they engender, like Frank Sibley was talking about, are one of the aspects of the toolkit that an artist has to work with. And I think, I, you know, I'm not sure there ever was an anti-aesthetic artwork, right? I mean, I, I think of Carl Andre's little things on the little squares on the floor, and you know, the metal is beautiful. <laughs> the flat gray steel, the articulation of the, right? It was anti-anesthetic, right? It wasn't anti-aesthetic, right? It was anti a particular kind of aesthetic. It was anti an abstract expressionist aesthetic, right? So I, I think of aesthetic properties as another kind of formal tool that artists use. And so that the artistic salience of an aesthetic property depends upon which category of art they're used to engage you, right? So there's some contexts where an aesthetic property is appropriate, some contexts that it isn't. In Blue Velvet, the movie Blue Velvet, being disgusted is the right aesthetic property, right? There are other movies where being disgusted makes me leave the room, <laughs> right? Because the purpose of disgusting you is different, right? The purpose of being disgusted in Blue Velvet is to enjoy Dennis Hopper at his best or something, I don't know. That was a joke, but, but you know. But does, I don't know, if that, does that get to your question? That I, so that I think the evaluative significance of, of even aesthetic art is always categorical in this way. That a Schoenberg piece is going to be highly creative, even if it's not aesthetically rich in a different yeah. way. Yeah. So a Schoenberg piece um, would, would be, you know, many people would agree is, 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 is highly creative because it fundamentally manipulates the uh, conventions of, uh, of uh, what determines what a musical composition is in a very, very fundamental way without... Well, most people would also agree without providing particular aesthetic pleasure. You know what I'm going to say, right? I love those pieces. <laughs> the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music uh, Studio was in my studio building for 15 years. And I just loved going down there and listening to what they were doing. Because that category of art had some. It, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe I'm making a bad joke. Have you read Finnegan's Wake, though? I have it on my bedstand for about the last 30 years, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's we, genuinely you know, We should continue this. I think that these, these are the right questions, I, I think, to ask about this stuff. I think these are excellent questions. I think we can also bring them back uh, later on to some things we looked at yesterday where I think there's a lot of relevance um, to some of the images that we saw from the arguments. So um, as we move into our last Thank you. Thank you.